Hi everyone, it's good to see you. I think you're there. <laughs> it's good to be seen anyway. Uh, today we're going to talk about what got me into piercing, maybe do a little piercing. Uh, it got uh, started with what I call holoforms. I originally had made some threaded baseball boxes and then Christmas time came and I wanted to make these a little lighter so they would hang on a tree. So trying to figure out how to do that, I began with two hemispheres that I glued together. I use a radius gauge on the inside to get the inside radius as perfect as I can get it. And then I'll use calipers on the wall thickness as I do the outside uh, to match that. Uh, they come out pretty decent. Uh, if they're not perfect, if you're going to pierce, uh, you know, perfection is, is not a requirement there uh, because you're, you're gonna lose it in the piercing. Uh, so let's get started. I used a round block, uh, could be square, but it's going to be round before we get it done. Uh, I'm going to start right now with approximately twice the diameter of the sphere. You can get by with less. I was doing baseballs, baseball sizes uh, out of baseball bat billets, which were 36 inches long, and I found out that I could save money if I could get seven pieces out of 36 inches. So that made them about five inches long for a close to three inch diameter baseball. We're gonna use a little bit more uh, than that tonight because we've gotta make a gauge to begin with. If, if you've never done this, we need to start with a gauge. So let's find a center. And if your pencil's not sharp, as opposed to just putting a cross on it, let's go around again Put a second line parallel to the first line. And then you'll find that the center of this little square, if it happens to be a square, is the closest thing you're gonna to get to center. On this end, did a little better job. So, at that point, I use a spring-loaded center punch and try to get that as close as I can. If, if it needs adjustment, you can go at a little bit of an angle and get that as centered as you can. I couldn't live without these. I have them laying all over the shop. Okay, so this is smooth enough. We can use uh, a, a, a four-prong drive spur. I like using the one-way style tail center. How did I do? It could be a little bit better, but for our purposes, we're not stuck on a particular diameter like we are if we're trying to recreate, recreate an exact uh, baseball size. All right, we're gonna true this up just a little bit before we, put, before we put dovetails on it and cut it in half and go to the chuck. A little shear scraping. Just because I like the finish. 
So I feel a little bit of flat spot there, but I like to true it up as much as I can to get, uh, or at least reasonably so, to get rid of any necessary, unnecessary vibration. I'm gonna put dovetails on each end. I'm gonna use a, a two inch chuck jaw. Uh, I'm gonna set this diameter as a guide. Be careful when you do this. This point touches the wood, this one does not. If it does, this thing is gonna kick up in your face. I'm gonna try not to demonstrate that for you. Okay, so we'll do something like that. We can also get over here and do it on this end. This one's a little trickier, but it can be done. Just make sure you keep that point away from it, away from the wood. I have this old set of Craftsman scrapers that I've made into dovetail scrapers. I have a right and left hand one. I'm headed for a 3 16th long dovetail. Approximately, we'll make that in two passes. By the way, this is hard maple. My favorite wood for this kind of thing, but I've made them out of everything. The opposite hand scraper for this end. If you get over 3 16th long on these Nova jaws, you're just crushing wood and not getting a good grip. I normally part this into two pieces uh, right on the center, off of the center line a little bit because I want to have a, a little nub left on the end so I can put a hanger in it in the case of a Christmas ornament. Uh, today it's uh, not that important, we're going to go right on the center because the first half, we're gonna cut a disc off of to match the internal diameter that we're looking for. So we'll waste that amount of wood here on this side. On this side, we'll save that end for the, for the hanging nub, if you will. Using a Chris Stott thin parting tool, it does get hot. You want to be careful you don't burn this because we're going to glue these two surfaces back together and we want that line to disappear. So uh, uh, use a, a light colored glue, don't burn the surface, da 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 da, all of that nice stuff uh, to try to make that line go away. So I'm not going to go all the way in there. I like using uh, today's version of a plumber saw uh, to finish this off. Could you hand me that saw right there on the end? Please, thank you. So this plumber saw basically has no set to it. So it's always nice to get the tool rest out of the way. You can go in that 1 16th slot, try to keep the teeth off of the surfaces. And, and the reason that is important is, is for one thing only, and that's when we come back, we want to align the grain. So if we can, it, it's gonna be off a little bit because we're gonna lose some wood in the middle, especially right here where you see that V, uh, it's not gonna come back together exactly, but we wanna waste as little wood as possible. And, it doesn't make much difference what you see on the, did I do it far enough? Yeah. What you see on the center, because all of that is going to be hollowed away anyway. All right, so let's put that in a chuck. I do not use a crush washer here. I don't like them. I think it creates vibration.
And I have an old version of the chuck body here, but that's okay. It clamps very nicely. It'll put just a tiny little bit of pressure on there. Just to make sure that seats. And we'll get a good grip on it. How did that turn out? As usual with Chuck Jaws gripping hard and soft grain, it's a little bit off. So we'll true that up again. Get this end a little bit. Now it's so important to get that smooth at the moment. What I do want to do is find the center again. And I'm going to hold this with my finger and just kind of let the tip burn in a little bit. Let's see what that looks like. Nope, I've got too much stuff there, so let me. I've got to waste some more wood. Oh, yeah, I ripped that out pretty good, didn't I? All right, well, the other way to maintain this center for what we're going to do right now is just to leave a little nub there. And so we don't get holes confused. That's what we're going to use. Now I want to part off a gauge, a radius gauge. And for that, I'm going to use the diamond-shaped parting tool because I do have some wood to waste. So when we cut the disc, the radius gauge, out of the center, we did that this time, but the, to keep the uh, grain alignment as close as possible, uh, we should have cut that off of the end first. And that can be done very easily between centers, and that will give you pretty much automatically that center point that we were looking for. All right, so we have to find a diameter here that is at least an eighth of an inch, a little more than an eighth of an inch less than the final sphere diameter we're looking for. Now what is important here is we can't put a square edge up against a radius inside of this, so we're gonna have to round this off. So the radius on this disc has got to be at least uh, as, as small as the radius we're going to in, inside. It can be smaller than that, so we'll just uh, knock some corners off here. And then we'll sand that off a little bit just to make it look pretty. And then we'll go ahead and part this off. Okay. So here is our radius gauge. Uh, we're going to do this, you know, after you do this, if you're going to create multiples out of the same size, uh, block of wood, you can save this. I have about a dozen of them around here in uh, different, uh, different diameters. All 
All right, so it's important now to find, uh, to draw a line across the center of this. And it doesn't make any difference. Let me get a straight edge. It doesn't make any difference where you put it just as long as it goes through the center. And I'm pretty sure that's where my center is. I uh, may be blocking a camera with my hat, but. Okay. And we're gonna clean up this surface right here, which we're going to glue to the other half. I heard that you couldn't shear scrape end grain, but I've been doing it for so long, it's one of those things you can't teach an old dog new tricks. So let's inspect that. And see that there's no or minimal tear out right around the edge, because that's all we're concerned with. We're gonna turn the rest of this away. All right, now, let me find my calipers again. We're going to check this diameter. Roughly, a little smaller, a hair smaller, definitely not larger. Get this tailstock out of the way because this thing right here has created a lot of scars. And if we see right here that we've got plenty of wood to work with, so let's score this. Right about there. Again, don't let this end hit or this is gonna go that way. Now we get to hollow that out into a hemisphere. We get, we get close to that line we just put on it. We're not going quite there yet. We'll step this in. And as we get to this point here, we need to start thinking hemispherically. Could be smoother than that. All right, does it look like I'm halfway in? What do I do with it? Well, it's not a bad looking radius, and you'll see right here that. You know, this line in the center has to go flush with the surface right here, and it's got five sixteenths of an inch to go. So we can take a pretty good cut right from the bottom out. And it doesn't have to go five sixteenths on, on this edge, on the diameter, so we need to taper out, a deeper cut here, start tapering out to zero here. Well, let's see what we got with that. You can check this often. The more experience you get, the less you have to check. But now we see that it's hinging right here. So the diameter is too small. The depth, you know, we've got clearance there. So. We concentrate on the outside, outside, the major diameter right here at this point. And here's where I use the Ellsworth bump. 
We'll talk more about that later. But in finishing this out with this bump, I can go, I can do a push cut. Pretty much all the way to the bottom. And then I can come in here and do a pull cut. All the way to the edge. All right, so now you can see that I've got a hinge point just about 45 degrees into this. And I've got at least 3 sixteenths farther to go. So let's go in a little deeper. You know, you think you're in an eighth of an inch and you're only a sixteenth, so, you know, get a good bite. Concentrate a little bit in the center this time. Taper out to the edge. Oh, it's getting much better. Uh, maybe 3.30 seconds of an inch to go. Uh, hinge point now about 30 degrees in, and the depth is pretty good. So let's try for another 16th. Tapering out to the edge. Thinking hemispherically. All right, this hinge point, we're back at 45 degrees again, so let's uh, scrub that away right in this area. Again, back and forth with that Ellsworth bump. Works. Just inside of the edge is, okay, it looks pretty even actually, so let's go all the way through with uh, with a cut. Oh, that is getting so close. And just off center is where it's a little fat. Five degrees and it's still just a little ways to go. That is so close. There's a little bit of bump in here, but we're going to pierce that away. So uh, you don't have to sand so much. I, I did weigh some of these before and after piercing, and I found out that piercing removes about 75% of the wood. So there's not a lot of surface left to concern yourself with for sanding or, or a great finish, because you're, ne you're never really gonna see it. At this point, you can paint the interior. If you do paint, I'll just show you a quick little tip here. I would put tape all the way over that edge right there. 
And then if I can find a razor knife, just happen to have one. Trim that. So you don't paint that surface because, again, we want that line to disappear. We certainly don't want any paint stuck in our glue joint. So depending, depending on the wood, you can spray this, but I've had instances where the spray paint, the lacquer, has uh, penetrated right through to the outside surface. And that was okay, but it resulted in me having to paint the outside to cover up the paint that I'd put on the inside. So maybe an acrylic that you brush on might be better. Again, you're not gonna see much of it. If you have brush marks, you're, you're never gonna notice them. So uh, acrylic, something like that, that won't penetrate so deep is probably a better choice. Okay, so we've got about an eighth of an inch wall thickness here, and that's way too much. We wanna get down to about a sixteenth of an inch. 3.30 seconds maximum uh, is what I've found for piercing. Uh, beyond that, you're gonna spend your life uh, in a smoky, dusty environment. And uh, there's a lot more fun things to do. So let's, uh, let's set up a caliper. We're going to set this at about 3.30 seconds. Well, I had a scale somewhere. I'll just uh, visualize it at this point. Uh, it's about 3.30 seconds. There's nothing really scientific about this to begin with. And then we're going to come up here and do the outside. We'll get started. And you can come back this way and get rid of a little extra wood. When you're doing this, though, it's making that V-groove. Don't run into the old surface there, or uh, you, you're going to have more work to do. You might have to start all over again. We'll keep as much wood back here as we can at all times to reduce the amount of vibration. Now, just like you would be turning a bow from scratch here, let's look at a nice, even curve, and then we're gonna start checking it. We're still a little thick, but we can run this down here and find out that it's getting much thinner over here. Uh, so if I reduce this before I lose too much wood, uh, I'll try to blend those together. I'm gonna do that with shear scraping. And look what you get with it. Lots of vibration. And that means chatter in the surface also, but we're going to sand it some, so. All right, let me get this over here where you can see it. It's getting a little thin right there. Huh. Did I go too far? Am I getting over anxious just because it's a video? Let's see. Let me spring that a little bit. Oh, it's getting pretty thin down there. Okay. Uh, yeah, it really is. All right, let's see if we can salvage this. Check it again. Let's see, it'll gotta open up again. So look at a little gap in here and try to keep that gap consistent. And it's coming back together. That, uh, it's gonna have a little thin spot in it. 
but I don't think it's gonna make a whole lot of difference in the end. Right. Not too bad. I'm not going to go much farther here uh, because I want a little strength when I get back after I get these back together uh, so I can work on the other end. So let's uh, pull this one off and put the other half on. Yep, got to chew it up again. All right, so the second half is chucked up, and as usual, it's out of balance. So let's, uh, you can hear that. It's important to get this as smooth as possible on my lathe since I already have a bearing problem. Now let's move over here and clean up this edge. Excuse me, this surface, this blue surface. Don't roll over the edge here. If anything, you want to go this way. No more than 180 degrees, if you go this way, it's gonna open up your glue joint. You're gonna to see too much glue. And I can see that I've got a ridge out there, so I overkill, I didn't go all the way to the edge. We can always come in here, remove the center, remove the center material. Terrible, terrible vibration. And use a straight edge across here to make sure that we're, we've got a flat surface and that looks pretty good. And I don't see any significant tear out there, so we can move on. I believe we're still set with this. Yes. So we'll get us a guideline. Certainly no larger than the radius gauge. Oh, I know that some of you want to know how fast we're turning. Let's see if we can get a visual on that. Three hundred and sixty nine meters per minute. 
Okay. That's 2,421 feet per minute. It calculates automatically. How's that look? 2,421 revolutions per minute. I don't use that tool very often. Coming out close to our guideline. Start hollowing in steps. Start thinking hemispherically. Let's see where we are. The bottom is a little flat, and we have about a quarter of an inch to go. scrubbing back and forth with that Ellsworth bump just because I could feel that it wasn't quite right. All right, just off the bottom, there's a little hump, but we still have a fat eighth of an inch to go. Another check we can do here, and sometimes it gets stuck, but just, just if you can't get all the way in, you want to make sure that you're not too large here, you put your radius gauge in right here, and boy, I'll tell you what that is. That's what happens, it gets stuck when you get close, so now, we're, there you are. All right, so I see about 30 degrees in, there's a hump. I have moved that hump into about 60 degrees. I can see the line right there. By the way, there's absolutely no pressure on this tool doing this. And that is getting so close. If you go over, if you go a little bit too deep, you can always face off this a little bit more. We haven't done that yet, and our hump is now at about 45 degrees. The depth looked pretty close. And the hump is just inside the front edge. That looks like a good place to stop. All right, now let's come around here. 
Let's get this up a little closer. Now let's make a bowl. check before we get too far to make sure we didn't go too far and I still have a thick wall up front a little thinner at about a quarter of an inch in and thick again so we'll take a little bit off there a little less off there and a little more off as we go down here. And then we'll waste a little wood on this side so we can go farther. Let's clean up a couple of those rings a little bit while we've got some wood to back us up. I'm looking at this surface right here. You see it over here. Pretty good until I get down to within an eighth of an inch of this, so I can start there. Actually, I'll waste a little more wood first, and then I'll come in here at about an eighth of an inch from there and start and come on down. Scrape just to get the surface trued up a little bit. That's not looking too bad. about halfway down that cut. You know that surface I told you you didn't want to hit? I just hit it. Ah, okay. Um, see if we can salvage that. I'm going to salvage it. it uh, that's something you don't want to do. Uh, but I'm not ashamed to show my mistakes. 
So let's get on with this and see if we can complete it. True up everything again. Not the surface. That's if that's out a little bit. That's the way it's going to be. Still a little thick, starting right about there. Again, don't hit that bottom surface. Still thick. By the way, don't pull your tool back into the wood this way. Always move in the forward direction. Well, it's not thick enough that we eliminated the chatter. Okay, we're going to stop at that point. Let's compare the other half and find out that our diameters are a little bit off, but that's okay. And we're going to look for grain alignment here. And I have that op exactly opposite. There you are. That's the way it came apart. And, and it's not going to be perfect, but you know it's a good it's a good start. So let's lay that down there like that, so I can remember it. Nope, not going to do that because I've got to move this. I found out that the tool rest will guide your glue bottle. For white woods, I use Elmer's. And I don't want to use too much. Get a bead on here, and even, nice, even as you can. But that's almost impossible to do. So we're looking for 100% coverage. We don't have it yet, but we're headed in that direction. I'm going to use the tailstock to put a little pressure on that. And we'll scrub that just a little bit to get glue over the entire surface. And then we'll check and make sure we didn't have any on the inside or minimal on the inside. The outside is not much of an issue. That's going to be sanded somewhat. And we will get that as close to center as possible and pull the tailstock up. Sometimes it's good to take the center out of this so it doesn't push it off center because it's not perfectly aligned. Not a lot of pressure, just something to hold it. You can see the difference in diameters that can be sanded away 
that won't make any difference in the end. All right, just to get this off the lathe, I'm gonna put a piece of tape on it. That should hold it where it needs to be. Pull the tailstock. Remove it from the chuck, set it aside. In fact, we will even remove a chuck. I can find the hole. and replace it with one that was glued up previously. All right, just so we could get a visual of what's going on here, I've sanded this a little bit, so that's what our final glue joint is going to look like. Um, I can see it, I've done these before where I couldn't see it at all, but 75% of it's gonna be sanded away, carved away. So let's sand a little bit on the rest of it and watch how that gets cleaned up. We'll put that up there just for fun, and you can see how ugly that is. And I think I'm using 150 grit here. Start sanding on the high side, bring it down to the low side, you can feel which way is which. Then you can go after the excess glue, which I see a little bit of right there. when all the excess glue is going away. We can sand the entire surface now. You probably saw a little vibration in that, a little out of round. Yes, it's there, it's okay. Get on this side, we'll change the drill, the sander direction. This one has some bug holes in it. Again, I'm gonna pierce them away. So that's not, a, not an issue. So that looks pretty good for about three quarters of it. Now we're going to go down here and get this small end. Remove that excess wood. Don't put a lot of pressure on the tailstock here because you don't have a lot of wood in this area. I don't have to remove all of that. It just feels good. 
let me move to the parting tool. I do want to get a little closer, and I can do that with a better tool rest. By the way, I do use the collars on tool rest. I like them. 95% of the turning I do, I keep this set at the same level. Obviously, this one is not attached. Let's get one that is. That's my spare. When I made this tool rest, I made two of them. All right, being as gentle as we can. We want to leave a little bump on this end because if it, it's a very thin wall and if it tears out, we're going to be in trouble. And we can leave a little bit of wood there. We can tear out a little bit because, mm, nope, not that much. That, that worries me a little bit. So let's go in here with a knife. Oh boy, that's tender, isn't it? Now this movement right here is caused because I didn't leave as much wood up here. The one we just turned has, is a little fatter and a little more stable. There, we can get rid of that. Okay, let's see if we can get rid of this. We don't have a lot of strength left. I'm going to change grits up to 100 to try to get rid of this. Okay, we've got that rough down with 100. Let's put the 150 on. See if we can't smooth it out a little bit. It, it looks pretty round. It's All right, we're gonna to come to this side over here and create a little hanging nub, if you will. And that's hopefully is going to look something like this. Man, I make my own little rings there out of copper wire. Use a quarter inch round nose scraper. A little bit from the right, a little bit from the left. Not too much of either at a time. We can see in here we've still got a little bit of sharp line left. So we've got to get a little bit closer in here. 
I think that just disappeared. I have that, that part down to the diameter that I think I want, so let's put a little sandpaper on that. Try to get a little 150 in there. Oops. Don't get hung up in the lathe. If that thing is going to rip your paper and take it away from you, let it go. That looks pretty good. Let's get back in here and form a little ball on top of that if we can. paper on that. Make that look a little round and now if I can find my parting tool. I'm not looking for perfection here. Just want to get this thing off in one piece. Try to visualize a little spear there that can be hand sanded. Oh, look, starting to move. So there, we can always hand sand that off. You can always drill a hole in this later, but I find that a drill hits the grain and goes funny places. So I use the piercing tool and uh, that makes a better deal, better hole for me. Okay. Uh, we were going to do some piercing. So let me hook up a carver. Hollow spears for me have evolved a number of Christmas ornaments here. First we started with the hollow spear, which is actually a spear and, and that carving is my running bond brick pattern. Um, I, I, then I went flat spheres, so I've got uh, stars of David. Uh, somebody said that was a throwing star. I thought it was a snowflake. Uh, then I had the star of Bethlehem over here. 
uh, from flat spheres, uh, elongus spheres. I figured, you know, these things don't have to be quite so round. We can do other things with them. And then what happens if you invert something? So I tried the invertosphere, and I guess luckily I did that with two different woods so you can see what's going on. And that was actually a mistake that I had to repair, uh, but it worked out. Uh, I tried once to do green wood, so I had this um, green cherry burl, and of course I expected it to go crazy, but it didn't come apart. It did show the glue joint a little worse, but I decided just to leave that alone, and now we can look at it anytime we want. Uh, my version of Chinese balls, there's nine balls here, and that's why I have so many of those radius gauges. Uh, I think I got all nine of them pierced. It's hard to see down to the middle, but there's nine of them. Different woods, that one on the oak, outside is white oak. Uh, no, excuse me, that's red oak on the outside. Uh, so it, it's pretty resilient. The toughness that we relate to oak is also found in these uh, hollow spheres. Uh, it's a very tough wood. Uh, my baseball has evolved. I decided to pierce that one. Uh, painted the inside so uh, you could see a little contrast. Uh, Lace that one up. That was a, a trip learning how to do that and of course making the needle to do it. Uh, since then, uh, you may have seen my football which is currently over at the Art Center, uh, the uh, Glen Allen Cultural Center on display. Uh, Gene Milstead and I had a discussion one day about putting a cube inside of a spear, a ball. And a cube has six corners, and my cube turns out with only four 90-degree corners. Uh, it looks like a square donut, but uh, if you can figure out how to make a turning with six corners, let me know. I might put one in here. And, of course, that went on to bigger things, and uh, that's uh, uh, another story when you have to think about the thickness of the bottom because you can't use a gauge on something like that. So I use a dental drill type carver. This one is a Vortex F5. Uh, paid a lot of money for this. Uh, Jim Zorn uses a dental drill, an actual dental drill, which is about the same thing, uses the same size burrs. Uh, twist this and remove and replace that burr, and I can't think of the number of those, the number on that right now, but it's a straight spiral, uh, a long uh, burr, which reaches in the, this uh, 330 seconds maximum, uh, maximum depth cut that you're looking for. Uh, the regulator, I just set mine up here to lay on the bench. Uh, this thing runs at uh, about 38 PSI maximum. Uh, people have asked uh, about their compressor too, being too large. Uh, that's not an issue. The regulator takes care of that. Uh, you can probably adjust the regulator on your compressor, and you've got another regulator right here. So uh, not a problem. You, you might uh, get too small, but I don't think you can get too large. So this has a control valve that makes a lot of makes this thing make a lot of noise. And my hearing was probably going before this, but this doesn't uh, doesn't help. I mentioned earlier about piercing the hole for the hanger. There's a little center right there. And that should be enough for a piece of wire and some glue around it. So I'm going to start uh, on the bottom end of this, and I can still see the center there. Let's see where we go. Okay. So that looks like a pretty good wall thickness, about a sixteenth of an inch. Uh, I'm going to go in here and get rid of that whistle. I'm going to polish up these edges. Uh, you get some burn on it. It doesn't burn 100%, so I like to remove what I can.
Okay, so that gives you a nice polished edge, if you will. Now you don't have to do that in every hole. Uh, you can get wild. So that shape could be a car with large uh, rear wheels or something. Uh, sometimes I, I try to carve certain states. Uh, you get kind of bored with this thing. You think about some weird stuff. The uh, What you're looking for, though, is to try to keep the web. Two things. Try to keep the web consistent between all the holes and get rid of those little sharp edges, which we'll do in a minute. And also, the volume of wood removed, try to keep that consistent from one hole to the next. Now, I said you didn't have to do that. You didn't have to polish those edges on every hole. I meant at each time you do a hole, you can do a series. But I like to get this hole before you get this hole polished up before I go to this one because if I tried to come in here and do this one and then come over here and do this one, this this web may get a little bit too thin. generally good to do this with a fan behind your back because there is a smoky dust that comes off of this. Luckily we have the door open today and some fresh air circulating. And I don't expect to be here doing this for hours today. I'm dusting this off with the rotation of the cutter as opposed to against it. If you go in the other direction, it can dig in, and all of a sudden you have no web left. That doesn't mean you can't repair it. I actually crushed my football. I had it on a carving stand and put too much pressure on it. It fell over and broke up into what resulted in an eight-hour repair. All right, so we've got this area here that is worm-eaten. We've got a, a wide spot right there. Let's see if we can get lucky and... Carve this out. Kind of start over here. Get up to the edge of that one. Let's come over here. All right, so we got a little worm-eaten thing there. I'm not sure what uh, we might get, and let's go for this right now. Yeah, that, that got smaller instead of larger, so that's good. Let's just get all of this while we're here, and of course the pieces fall on the inside. You can dump them out periodically.
and we'll break up the pattern here uh, of what we were doing and see if come in from this side. And lots of times this stuff that uh, is left behind in the wormholes it will stay in place if you treat it gently. That thing's going around in a circle. And when you spray this with the lacquer, it will sink in there and kind of weld that stuff in place. So I think that's going to survive. Okay, so I, I kind of broke up the pattern that I was headed in, so let's talk about pattern a little bit. Some of these pieces are totally random, and, well, they're all kind of random, but uh, these early pieces had no guidelines or anything, uh, and they turned out okay, I believe. Uh, this piece, moving later on, I did not do any guidelines on at all, and you can see kind of a diagonal pattern forming here, which I found out I didn't like. That happened by accident. Uh, as opposed to something I had done earlier, uh, doing this uh, running bond brick pattern, what I do sometimes on the lathe is lay out some guidelines while this is able to spin, rough guidelines to follow. Uh, even on pieces like this, where you keep Everything in a row, one row, another row, another row, roughly. So everything is kind of followed around as opposed to going sideways. Uh, sideways over here, straight, sideways over there. Uh, so there are some guidelines. Do them lightly and they sand off very easily. So that has a square donut on the inside. There are other things you can do. I have done birdhouses. If you, while you've got the two pieces uh, apart, uh, drill a couple holes, use a toothpick or a skewer, put a perch in there, glue up a bird uh, that you know you can put the other half on without without damaging it, and. Uh, Carve away wood until the bird starts chirping. So I've got a couple of birds I haven't used. That small one was much easier to carve around than this large one. Of course, I'm doing that size, uh, that size ornament. Uh, may want to do it a little larger for him so you don't carve into him. Another one that I haven't gotten to yet, I plan on soon, uh, a nativity scene. What's more appropriate for a Christmas ornament? than a nativity scene on the inside. Uh, that I believe I'm going to put a platform in maybe a third of the way up to give enough room uh, for Mary and Joseph to stand up. Well, so Joseph can stand up. Mary is kneeling, of course. So yes, uh, you can put things on the inside. I mentioned these uh, copper wire hangers that I use. and. Uh, I make my own. If you've got a, a transformer out of some piece of electronics with some very thin wire, there these things are so easy. Cut off a length of it. Stick a drill in it, twist it around the drill. Tighten it up. Cut off the excess to where it'll fit down in that hole you created. Slide it off the drill. And you have a very nice little eye. Copper with enamel paint on this one, of course. So uh, very delicate and a lot more delicate than what you can buy in the hardware store. I like them.
Okay, are there any questions? Thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure, it's been a lot of fun. I hope we can do it again, and thank you to our videographer. <laughs>